Hello, I hope you had a good reading month in July. Uh, as always, if you read anything that's particularly good or that you would recommend or uh, that you think that I would really like, uh, please let me know about it in the comments below. I always really enjoy hearing about the books that other people are reading, um, especially if it's something really excellent. So I've been sitting here in my study library enjoying reading in my new reading chair, uh, which I can show you by shifting over the camera a little bit. You can see it there in the corner. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's been a fun little new addition to my uh, my little tranquil reading space here. And uh, so I had a real mixture of reading experiences this month. Uh, some books were really excellent, uh, some I really didn't enjoy at all, and, uh, and then there are other ones which I just felt quite mixed about. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go through uh, all the books that I read this month and talk about them individually, starting off with Lucy Elman's new collection of essay called Things Are Against Us. And so I was a big fan of Ducks Newburyport and I really enjoyed the the voice in that and the all the lists of the preoccupations in that and if you've read that book you won't be surprised about the content of this collection of essays which concerns a lot of the same things that's discussed in Ducks Newburyport uh, from old movies to YouTubers that show their morning routines uh, to Laura Ingalls Wilder um, who she loves and uh, also about Poor Agatha Christie, um, who she really doesn't love and and really rails against, and and uh, and has a little rant about Doris Day as well. And uh, but also a lot of it is about uh, criticizing the patriarchy, and uh, so men get it pretty bad in uh, these essays. And uh, Lucy Elman goes to these extremes of arguing that men should surrender all of their wealth to women, and uh, and to see how that works out, and. Uh, and so suggest these radical changes in a slightly churlish, like comical way. I, I don't think she's not totally serious about it. I think she would really like to see it happen, but is is realistic about it and realizes it's not totally gonna happen. And and the tone of a lot of these essays, I think, are quite comical. I, I, she talks about how she often resorts to pratfalls in times of sort of crisis and emergency. And um, since some of these essays are about the pandemic in the, the past year and a half, then uh, the, that's sort of what she she's resorting to in, in a lot of these. And I, mean, I think, so she's quite a controversial figure in that. Um, and some statements she's made publicly, um, you know, around the Booker time. And since then, um, she's been really criticized for. She is not soft about her opinion. She really goes in there and uh, and tells you exactly what she thinks, which I really admire in, in a way. And obviously, some of her opinions, I don't really totally agree with and that I would I would argue with some of them I would argue quite strongly with and then other parts of her opinions I, I, I would I, I'm quite sympathetic towards and and I think her critique of the patriarchy especially like is 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 really warranted and and she talks about how lethal misogyny is and and which is absolutely true and I think can't be emphasized enough and and so yeah so she she goes through a number of different subjects and I think sometimes her targets aren't really that's maybe not what she should be focusing on so much. It's not like so warranted. Like when she goes into to to YouTubers and their morning routines and and you know I, obviously as a YouTuber myself, I'm not. I don't make those sorts of videos. And and obviously I know there's a lot of shallowness and uh, and narcissism here on YouTube. Like like you just you see that instantly when you go on there. And I think some of her critiques could use a bit more dynamic engagement when talking about them um, that she could go into these arguments in a, in a slightly more interesting way. So I, she's one of these real like lover hater authors um, that uh, and uh, and but personally I really enjoy her point of view and, and I'm glad that she doesn't allow herself to be silenced even though she gets criticized quite a lot. I think just recently she went off Twitter totally um, because she was being lambasted on there so much which um, she wasn't surprised about at all and she admits in these essays that she's sort of fighting against a, a tidal wave um, in her opinions and she doesn't expect them to be 
adopted or, or even necessarily heard, but she's um, going to use her voice. And uh, one of the most successful essays, I, I think, in this collection actually is a play upon uh, Virginia Woolf's essay, Three Guineas, um, which is called Three Strikes, where she uses the same structure, um, where it's a very short essay, but there are enormous footnotes. So you can see just on the first page alone, there's just a few lines, and then all of this is footnotes. Notes and and going into the sort of nuance of her opinions and and these um, these tangents uh, that she goes on and, and detailing these these small uh, going into greater detail about these small aspects of um, that she's writing about and and I think she her writing is most successful when she has these sort of constraints that are self imposed that she puts on the structure of what she's writing about in order to get her point across and like in Duck's Newport report the structure of that novel was was very definite I mean it, it had a rhythm and a flow to it and and when her opinions are, are sort of filtered through that, I think that's when it works the best. Then I read a couple of novels which are actually really interesting to compare side by side. I mean, you wouldn't think to um, to compare these novels, but they, they do have a common thing in that both the, the novels are about a central character that has been in love with another character throughout their entire lives, but for different and complicated reasons, they haven't been able to be together um, but the approach to writing about this subject matter is handled very differently in these two different books. And so in The Hummingbird by Sandro Veronese, I, I made a whole video you know, ranting against this, this novel and, and how I really didn't like it and, and just how I was really expressing my confusion about there's been so much praise for, for this book uh, and this is considered one of the greatest Italian writers working today and I just didn't, don't really understand why. Why? And, and I think it really is because of the way he structured the book, but also that the you're, that y I got this strong sense that you were supposed to empathize with this main character, this, this, this man at the center of the book, who you follow his life through a number of decades, um, going backwards and forwards and, and using a number of different formats like like letters and um, and or memories or, or conversations that he has with people and it meant that you just see everything through sort of his point of view even though it's not in the first person but it's all so much focused on him that I felt like I really couldn't get to know any of the other characters and and I don't need to read about characters that I necessarily like or, or that you, you know that are, are sort of like positive characters that I want to root for and but at the same time like I, I felt like the tone of the narrative was off from my sort of feeling um, I suddenly have a very itchy nose I have to scratch it <laughs> but uh, yeah so um, that I just that didn't really work for me and, and I, I know somebody commented on my video saying like, like well maybe you're supposed to the, the author is kind of critiquing him and 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 y you're not supposed to entirely sympathize with him but that's just not the feeling I got from the way it was written and the way this novel is presented I um yeah I felt like the the overall narrative should have been a bit harsher and more critical of of him as a character and and so that's where I think my real problem lies along with some of the details that I talk about um, in the, the video that I discussed like especially the representation of his wife and her mental health issues I just thought really wasn't handled very well at all whereas in the paper palace um, by Miranda Cowley Heller um, this this novel like handles that so in such an interesting way and it's structured where at the very beginning of the novel you see a uh, a woman who's at a at a camp in New England out in the um, countryside in the forest by a lake and um, it's her sort of family campsite and uh, she's there with her family and the night before the opening chapter of this she had sex with a man that she's been in love with all of her life but they've not been able to be together and she's done this while she's there with her husband and her children and her very difficult mother and you follow her in the 24 hours after um, the this occurrence and you see all the the details and the um, nuances of the interactions between um, with her and her family and the man that she's in been in love with for so long while getting these flashbacks to memories and uh, details about how she was raised and her complicated family life and um, and her family life that included a lot of horrible abuse and um, and detailing 
uh, all of that and, and a terrible secret that she has buried in her past. And, and as you're getting more details about the past, the representation of the present time and, and the day following this occurrence um, becomes so much more meaningful as you understand her relationships with these, these people so much more. And her, her husband is like treated in a, in a really interesting and dynamic way, as well as her, her lover, the man that she's been in love with for a while. And so I think there's a real even-handed approach to all of the characters and her mother as well, who's um, quite a difficult person, um, but someone that I really loved reading about. Um, I mean, I can see why she drives the narrator, the main character, crazy. Um, but, you know, it's one of these characters that I love reading about because she's so interesting and, and kind of like fabulous in a way, even though I, I know she must be a nightmare to live with. And so I thought that was all handled really interestingly. And, and, and you know, this dilemma of being in love with someone your whole life and not being able to be with them. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing that happens to a lot of people. And um, it, she handles this in such a sympathetic and interesting way Whereas, um, yeah, in The Hummingbird, how that's handled, it's, it's the way he, the author, handles this. It just um, it, yeah, didn't work for me as well. So, yeah, it's a sort of surprising, interesting parallel between these two books. I also read The Great Mistake by Jonathan Lee, which was one of my picks that, or of my predictions for the Booker Prize list, which didn't make it on it. But I'm so glad I read it. Um, it's really enjoyable. Very shiny cover. Um, really beautiful cover. I really like it. And uh, so it's about the life of Andrew Haswell Green, who was a real-life person um, alive mainly during the 19th century. And he, he was killed at the very beginning of the 1900s, and he's sort of known as the father of uh, modern New York, or the architect of, of New York, because he was responsible for a lot of the institutions um, that are so strongly associated with New York, like the the public library and Central Park and um, and the zoo and and um, so yeah, a lot of the uh, big institutions in uh, New York City and uh, and it's so interesting how he tells the story of his life, sort of um, backtracking. Um, you see the the present when he's he's murdered, and then it sort of backtracks and go to to his development and it's um, it's almost a sort of like Dickensian type tale of of this like rags to you know sort of riches tale or, or a man that grows into power even though he makes fun of that at one point and and uh, and he says when um, he's having his portrait painted and and uh, and he he gives some details where he's like oh people love that Dickensian nonsense of um, um, talking about uh, the development of someone's life like that. And uh, and yeah, it's so interesting how it uh, he goes into his past and how he has this repressed desire of an attraction towards other men, which isn't able to ever really be fully expressed or when it is slightly expressed, it's sort of, it has to be suppressed and he, he gets a big backlash from it. And so it's sort of a, a tragedy and there's a great loneliness at the center of this story, which is so powerfully described and and uh, and I found it very moving and and it's it's very subtle in in some ways in in showing that and showing his development and and how his his desire to create these bigger social institutions comes from his desire to really want to connect with other people and so he makes these spaces where people can connect with each other and and I found that so moving and also there's this interesting character um, who is a prostitute and and she's this woman that's grown to have this substantial wealth and she's sort of connected with this whole murdered case in a in a um, in an interesting way that like it the the whole mystery of, of why he's murdered um, is is quite interesting how that plays out but she's a really fascinating character as well and I would kind of love to read a whole novel just about her but um but yeah I thought this was a great novel that's really beautifully written and uh, so yeah I'd highly recommend this as a as a great historical novel and I read a passage north by Anouk Arad um, which I didn't predict was going to be on the Booker Prize list, but uh, now is on the Booker Prize list. And I just read it because I thought it sounded so interesting and was really just drawn to, to reading it. Um, this is the author's second novel. Um, he's still quite young. I think he's like in his early 30s. And uh, this is, I had a really complicated reading experience with this. And it's a bit difficult to describe how I feel about it because 
I think overall, I feel really sympathetic with its subject matter and really appreciated the uh, its point of view and um, and the the voice of it and what he has to say. Um, but the way he goes about it, I just I'm not too sure about. So the the story is about a man that returns to well, he's living in Sri Lanka um, after uh, the a period after the the civil war has taken place, um, living there with his mother and his grandmother and uh, his grandmother's former carer, um, she, who hasn't been living with them for, I think, a, a couple years, um, she d dies quite suddenly and he gets notice of this. And so he travels to the north of the country uh, to uh, attend her funeral. And, um, and that's all that takes place in the, the novel, the sort of action that takes place in the novel. And his, it, the bulk of it comprises his reflections and his meditations on like the nature of life, but also his position um, is someone who didn't experience the civil war firsthand, but very much feels the repercussions of it and and the, the genocide um, experienced by uh, the Tamil people who he comes from. And uh, so that point of view is really interesting, but um, the it's it's so thought driven, like you get so much into his mind and his uh, that parts of it almost feel like an essay or sort of like explaining to you these things. And I think that's my real where my real issue comes with it, too, because he'll he'll talk about a number of subject matters and go into it almost like an essay or like he's lecturing you. And if you've ever read the writing of Elaine de Botton, um, that it felt very similar to that to me, um, who Elaine de Botton is also a philosopher like Anuk Arad um but has written, both written in these like fictional forms in which they distill their philosophical ideas into these narratives. And, and I appreciate how it does that. And I listened to an interview with the author where he was talking about how he didn't want to just write books of philosophy because he felt like that was too limited, like he was trying to define terms and language and 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 certain like situations in, in a way of like completely explaining them, um, which uh, is, is, I mean, that's sort of the limitations of the practice of philosophy, which he understands and realizes, which is why he wants to work in a fictional form. And uh, and so, yeah, I, I understand that. And, and I sort of agree with that. And I think because I'm really interested in a lot of these larger ideas as well, but I much more appreciate it when it's um, weaved into a narrative and you're you're made to to feel these things and the complexity of these things and how so many of these big larger you know big life issues don't really have any answers and um but how he goes about doing that i just don't think is completely successful i think um i'm i'm sort of hoping that he will continue to write novels and and maybe this will be like his big ideas will be blended a bit more artfully with the the narrative that he's telling because I think where this story really comes alive is when he is showing his his grandmother and his interactions with the uh, the grandmother and uh, and her interactions with her care when when um, the care was living with them and um, it's such an interesting relationship and and really warm hearted and and you get some slightly comical bits on top of uh, or like alongside all the much more you know sort of deep thought bits of this story and um, and so that's where it really worked best for me but there wasn't too much of that and and also in the depiction of his like young love with this this woman who becomes um, a activist and and she really commits to her activism in a way that means that they can't really be together as as a couple anymore and and the way he shows other like communities in um so like the hijra community and aspects of the queer community i i thought was really sympathetic and, and interesting and and it's not that i disagree with any of the the thoughts or the ideas that he's sort of expounding upon although i did question some of them when he goes in into them um, i would i would i would want to have more discussions with him uh, about them but um, but it's yeah, just the way he relates it just felt a slightly too luxury, and um, and it, I think it's sort of interesting because uh, you know Joyce Carol Oates in her writing, she often writes about philosophy as well, and and she's um, really interested in philosophical ideas, and actually with her new novel Breathe, um, it goes into a bit into Spinoza in in this, but but the these ideas are really integrated into the lives of her characters and that's something that I've always appreciated so much about her writing that it's these 
larger ideas are sort of melded into the drama of what she's writing about in a way that doesn't feel um you know that it's like it's it's telling it's showing you more than just telling you i guess and um and and so yeah so i read uh, joyce carol's new novel breathe um which is so powerful and and moving um it's a depiction of of a woman grieving for her husband and it's the story of a of a couple um who moved from their home temporarily moved from their home in cambridge massachusetts to new mexico um because the, the husband gets a, a position at a distinguished institution there um temporary position there and they they go there sort of thinking of this as like the honeymoon that they never had they married 12 years ago but shortly after moving to this new place uh the the husband gerard he becomes terminally ill and uh she she stays with him during his illness and you follow his slow decline um until he dies but when he does die and you know that happens fairly early on in the novel she doesn't accept it she can't accept it because she loves him so much and and values him this relationship so much and and it's it's just heartbreaking because she can't accept it and then time becomes very strange in this story um because she in her sort of not accepting it she uses a kind of magical thinking um going back to a time when he was still alive and reliving moments of that and so the the it's described as kind of like a mobius strip the the narrative uh, because it's it's like looping sort of constantly back in in time and going into the present into the future and and it's she's going around in these circles and what she does in this story it's so interesting how then the the narrative kind of splits in two different directions and in her intense grief she feels haunted and persecuted by these godlike figures um that are that are there to menace her and and trick her and um and it's so terrifying she's like trapped in this nightmarish situation um which she's not really able to get out of and and so how she describes that di dilemma and her method of 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 doing that and showing it with these two different congruent storylines going in different directions and so neither of them is necessarily right um it's so interesting and innovative i i think this is such an artfully done novel i mean i mean i always admire her her writing but i think what she's done in this is is so interesting and and really moving and beautifully done and also in the descriptions of michaela the main character she um is a teacher and she teaches um life writing creative writing um classes about memoir and and uh, and her depiction of her relationships with the, her students are so interesting as well and how the fates of her students then get sort of caught in her timeline her divergent timelines and uh, and so yeah it's it's quite difficult to describe but the effect is i think so powerful and so yeah it's it's just a, a tremendously beautiful and moving novel that that's so sensitive and tackles this really difficult question that uh that how we will eventually lose the the people we love most in our life and then how do we carry on past that how do we carry on having a sense of self-worth if we've lost who we've loved most in our lives and it's such a, a poignant difficult question and um, and she handles it in such an interesting way in this book i also read a couple of uh, classic novels or older novels um so first off i read uh, passing by nella larson um which is a book that i've been wanting to read um for for so long and uh and it's quite a, a short novel um but it's it's so powerful and really surprising i think it was published in the 19 40s uh was it? oh no in the 1920s wow yeah so a really long time ago 1929 uh passing was first published and uh yeah the way she goes about this story um from a narrator of a black woman um who has a friend or someone that she knew earlier in her life um suddenly comes back into her life um she had suddenly disappeared um from their community early on and uh and she finds out why because this uh former friend of hers uh is very light skinned and was passing as white and married a white man and so had to disconnect herself um from the the black community that she grew up in and 
it's how she handles that relationship and the tension of that relationship and the interaction she has with this woman's husband uh, who has her husband has some very racist ideas um, and yeah how she gets into that I mean it's so tense and and really powerful and shocking and such an interesting way of, of looking at this this issue of skin color and the way our communities are organized because of it and also with the, the narrator's husband um, who really wants to leave the country and so there's this tension in their relationship where, where he um, yeah wants to, to sort of get away from Mer America and it's all its complex racial attitudes and um, and how she's caught between these two different perspectives of, of, of one this female friend who's who's not really a friend she doesn't really want to, to want to see her that much although she's strangely strangely compelled by her and uh, and yeah so sort of caught between these two different points of view and the way it dramatically plays out I mean the end is very shocking and, and surprising and um, and yeah such an interesting point of view it felt so like fresh and alive even though yeah this was published in the 1920s and uh, and then I also read In Youth is Pleasure by Denton Welsh who I've been wanting to read for ages and this is such a curious strange novel um, first published in the 1940s and then has this this new reprint of it and and uh, and yeah the story is a, about a boy on his summer holidays and he comes from this uh, privileged family and he has a father that lives in the Far East um, who he barely ever sees. Um, he goes to the, the main character, he goes to a boarding school, um, his name is Orville, and uh, and his father um, comes, takes him out of school and they go to a very plush hotel out in the countryside um, during which uh, alongside his two older brothers and he, he barely sees his father during this time. They don't really have much to do with each other and you just follow him as he goes about his days in his summer holidays uh, having very odd experiences and getting his sensory perception of the world and his aesthetic critique of the world around him and his perspective is so surprising and bizarre and interesting and a lot of his uh, his sort of desires and compulsions are are so strange and uh, yeah it's such a unique point of view and uh, I'm gonna have a lot more more to say about this novel. I'm going to have a conversation uh, with a, a sort of surprise guest that I'll, I'll post in a couple of weeks time um, where where we discuss um, this author and this novel in, in more detail because this book and this author um, has such a unique point of view. Um, this this author died when he was only 33 years old, I think, um, which is very young. And so, uh, so yeah, it's sort of sad that he didn't produce more work. Um, this is, uh, he only produced like, I think, a couple of novels as well as a memoir and, and some short stories. But, um, but yeah, um, so, so interesting. And I also read other people's Clothes by Kala Henkel and I, I mainly read this for the very shallow reason that it's set in Berlin and I wanted to read a novel that was set in Berlin because uh, I traveled to Berlin um, uh, two or three years ago and um, really enjoyed it and I don't know I just sort of fancied fictionally going back to that location and and uh, so it follows the story of two American young women uh, that are in art college and uh, they do this sort of study abroad type thing in Berlin and uh, and you follow it through one of their points of view um the her friend is uh, very privileged and um, she's not so privileged and she also has this murky dark past and um, and this very particular kind of personality where she becomes a bit obsessed with um, some people and so they move into an apartment together um, in Berlin uh, an apartment owned by this crime writer and they inhabit her apartment um, while she is away and while they're staying there they get this sense that they're being spied on by this this author and that she's basing her new novel on their lives and so they almost like fictionalize their lives by living this like glamorous uh, Berlin lifestyle and starting a nightclub up in uh, the woman's apartment and uh, so yeah it's quite a like fun story it's a very like plot driven uh, story um, and I, I mostly enjoyed it but uh, I thought 
it was overall like quite like frivolous and in, in how it tells their story and kind of the depiction of these like millennials that um, that want to be in the scene like where it's like happening and and their their drive to be like a part of Berlin nightlife and get in the right clubs and go to the right parties um just wasn't something I was very sympathetic with and so I just found it that whole aspect a bit shallow and annoying and I know the the novel is kind of critiquing that that aspect of their lives but um but yeah it just um it didn't engage me much like as as a story in that way and I mean it is like very twisty in its plot and it's um and so it's sort of satisfying in that way if you're looking for that in a narrative but um but that's yeah not really the kind of thing that I look for my my storytelling and so um so yeah i thought this novel was okay but um but yeah it just uh is probably quite forgettable overall um i'm not gonna remember it all all that strongly but uh yeah, that's that's the way it goes, and uh, and so I've I've started reading Richard Powers' novel Bewilderment. Um, I I wanted to finish Joyce Carol Oates's uh, new novel first because sorry, um, Joyce Carol Oates gets priority over the Booker Prize when she has a new book out. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I've started reading this in about fifty pages, and the the writing is gorgeous. It's really powerful and moving, and it's about subject matter I find so exciting and interesting. So uh, so yeah, I'm I'm loving reading this so far. And um, so, yeah, I'm sure I'm going to have a lot more to say about this in the, the future. So those are all the books that I, I've read. Um, I'd love to know if you have any um, thoughts or feelings about uh, any of these books, if you've read them or if you're interested in reading them now after I've talked about them or if you're not interested in reading them now. Uh, but yeah, also, if uh, if you've read anything really great lately that you uh, want to have a chat about in the the comments below um please uh please uh, leave your comments and we can have a discussion but uh hope you're doing well and reading good things i will speak to you again soon bye bye